And everybody wants to say, well, look at how much they're paying the CEO. They should give us that money. Why? You guys don't want to work. The CEO probably works weekends. The CEO probably stays after. The CEO has a mountain of, of responsibility on his shoulders and stress on his shoulders. He is responsible for hundreds of thousands of jobs. What's going on, everybody? This is Chris Noggle, and welcome back to the Money School Podcast. You know, here's what I'm going to teach you and talk about in this podcast. The simple solution to making a lot more money. Yes, that's exactly what I'm going to show you. And when I say simple, I mean brutally simple. You don't really have to go out and learn anything new to do this. You don't have to go out and go to college for this. You don't need a degree. You don't need a coach. You don't need a mentor. You just need to do one thing different. That's it. All it is is changing one thing that you're doing. And, and it's interesting. Let me take you back to where this episode started. This episode started when I was dropping my car off to get the brakes fixed. And when I was dropping the car off, I was talking to my buddy. We used to skateboard a lot together and he runs the whole service department. And I'm just talking to him about business and, and he says, booming, they're, they're so slammed. They got over a hundred cars out back. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. And, and he then tells me I got 46 guys working in the service department. I'm like, you know, he's explaining that. And, and then we, I go into it and I said, oh God, that's, that's such an opportunity. He said, well, you would think so. Because then he tells me how his guys are compensated. Because we were talking about minimum wage here versus Tennessee. Tennessee is $7 an hour. New York is going to be soon $15 an hour. There's a huge, huge discrepancy. He had one of his service techs move to Tennessee and he's having a hard time finding work. He's having a really hard time finding work that had this comparable pay to what the, he was making when he was here because his service guy had to move because of family reasons. But the whole point of what I'm getting at is he says to me, he says, all these guys are compensated on production. They have a guaranteed base, but the base is relatively low. He said it's a little above minimum wage. And for the, the guys, the seniority, you know, it's a little bit higher than that. But he says the majority of the way these guys can make money is production. He's, and I said, okay, so you got 100 cars out back. I said, that's just a massive opportunity. He said, you would think so. He said, every week I do a sit down with all my guys at 730 on a Friday. And I run through these opportunities and I literally break it down by the map. I literally go through and I explain the math of, hey, if they just work one extra hour every day or three extra hours every week, how much money that would be in their pocket. And it was substantial. I'm not going to go into numbers, but it was it was a pretty substantial thing because he broke it down. And he said, if one of my techs stayed an extra five hours per week, that would result in X amount more cars getting done. So they don't have a backlog of 100 cars sitting out back with 100 customers who all need rental cars or loaner cars, which cost the company money. All these things, I want you to factor this. And then we're going to really take and we're going to talk a little bit about the problems going on with this mentality. So think about that. You're largely compensated based on your productivity, okay? And your productivity can go up based on just working a few more hours. And that few more hours per week, let's just call it one hour per day on a five-day work week. You, you get the weekends off. But if you wanted to do more, you can certainly work Saturdays. So five hours more per week. Doesn't seem like a whole lot, right? You come in a little early, you leave an hour late, you know, and, and you have literally the ability to make a lot more money. How much more money would that be? Well, he said, depending on their productivity, each person could make up to an extra $500 per week, 500 per week. And he laid this out. He even showed them how to make up to $1,000 per week if they stayed in, or came in and worked just a morning on a Saturday. And they didn't have to do that. That was optional. They could make an extra $1,000 a week. Now, think about that. We're talking about a, a, a car repair place. You know, when you talk about white collar and blue collar, it's a blue collar job. But these guys can make an extra $4,000 per week. Or I'm sorry, per month. An extra 1000 a week. 4000 extra just by putting in a little extra time. And, and I and I looked at him and I'm like, holy crap. I'm like, you know, do, do, how many guys take advantage of that? He said, listen, when 4.30 rolls around, he said, because we, we leave at five, he said, people really slow their productivity down. And by five o'clock, I've literally got a line waiting to leave. 
I'm like, okay, I'm not worried about how many people want to leave. They clearly don't understand the, the opportunity here. How many guys stay? Zero. Zero. Even after he lays it out and says, here's how you make an extra 500, an extra thousand dollars. Zero. Stay. Folks, I want you to just think about that. All of those people, 46 people in the service department, all of them leave every single day at the exact same time, knowing there's an opportunity to make an extra $100,000, $500,000 a week by putting in just a little bit more time, just a little bit more effort, just a little bit more energy. They can make that much more money and zero of them take advantage of this opportunity. Please tell me what I'm missing here because it pisses me off. It pisses me off being, an, number one, an entrepreneur. Like I work extra. I don't think about how many hours I work. I just do what's necessary. I come in on the weekends if I have to, or, or usually just because that's just what an entrepreneur does. I stay as long as it's necessary. A lot of times I'll leave to go see my daughter and come back. And, and that's just what's needed. But think about that. I'm an entrepreneur. Okay. I own the business. So that's, that's kind of just expected, right? You know, you just expect entrepreneurs to work harder than everybody else. But like, let's just go to the rank and file W2 employees that we're talking about in this one company. This is one of hundreds of thousands of companies across this country. And not one person takes advantage of that. Let me tell you a story. I want to tell you a story of the early 2000s. I was broke as hell. I was broke as hell. I had retail stores, skateboard, snowboard shops, but I got caught up in the dot-com recession. When the recession hit, my business tanked. It tanked. It was down 30%. I was literally worried about my brand new boutique. I opened in Orchard Park, New York. It was like a snowboard town. And I, I it was doing really well and the recession hit. And then they dug the whole road up and they put new piping in. And so people had a hard time getting to my store. Business was tough. So I did what I had to do. I couldn't pay my bills, so I got a job. And where did I land? I landed in Wall Street. Now, now he, listen to me very closely. When I got into Wall Street, it was just like the movies. I was a I was pond scum. After I got my licenses, I was in the, the bullpen in the middle. They're just a bunch of cubicles. And literally all we did is patch calls off to the guys in the big offices on the edge. That was that was the job. Basically, we were connectors until we got our Series 7 license. We connected the outside guys and, you know, we studied. Now, I got my Series 7 pretty early on. I definitely had my 6 and 63 super early on. I was a go-getter. But here's what I did. I watched. I watched all the really senior advisors in those big offices that took up the whole perimeter. And I watched what they did. You know, most of them would get there right before the bell rang in the morning, right before the stock market opened. They would just get there. That's when they'd get there. Not early, just in enough time to either get there for a morning meeting or to just be there for the bell because they had to be right. That's when trading started. Not that we were active traders, but that's when that's when we wanted to see the action during lunch. Most all actually, I think every one of those guys in those offices that made, you know, I, let's say they made 300 to over a million dollars. That's about what they made. Every one of them left for lunch. They would go somewhere. I don't know. Many of them would go home. Even the managing partner, I remember, his name was Kamal. He would go home for lunch and he'd be gone for two hours. And most of the other guys gone an hour and a half to two hours. They'd come back and they'd put in, you know, and, and do their job. And I'd be patching calls over to them, talking to them, handing them off paperwork because that's just what we did. And, and they would all be gone by 4.30, no later than 5 o'clock. The market closed. They were gone. I want you to think about this. I saw this. I witnessed this. I was hungry. I was so freaking broke that when I got into Wall Street, number one, I was about to have my car repoed. So I was selling my car. I took a big loss on the car. Okay. But I watched these guys go to lunch and they would invite me to go to lunch and I couldn't afford to go out to lunch. So I was living at this house with a bunch of my friends out in the front of the house. We had a mulberry tree. Every day when I'd get home, I would go out in that mulberry tree and I would pick mulberries. I'd put them in Tupperware and I'd take them to work. Why? Because I didn't have money to buy lunch, folks. Sometimes my mom would bring me peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Sometimes I would take something out of the fridge. But, but all I'm trying to say is I couldn't afford lunch. So clearly... When I watched all these guys get there right before the bell, leave for lunch and leave early, I got an idea. I said, hey, I want one of those corner offices and I don't want to wait a long time to have one. So all I need to do, logically thinking, is I got to get here earlier than them. 
I started showing up at seven in the morning and I would work through lunch and I would pound the phones during lunch and people would answer because, hey, they're on their lunch break. And then at 4.30 or 5, when everybody left, guess what I did? I went out and I saw clients at their kitchen tables. And I did this consistently and persistently. I would work till 8 and 9 at night. So I would drive two hours to go see a client out in, in ski town, like Ellicottville, there's Springville and all these places. It's about an hour and a half to two hour drive. I would drive all the way out there to meet with a client and then drive all the way home. No matter what the weather was, it could be a freaking blizzard. There was the money. That was what I needed. I needed the money. So I did what it took. Your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. I did what everybody else in that firm was unwilling to do. I did what all those other new reps, because in the beginning, when I first got there, there was probably 20, 25 brand new reps. We were called the new org. We were brand new. After a year, there was probably 10 of those 20 to 25 left. After three years, I was the only one left. It was either maybe, maybe Vinay was still there after three years, but it was only me and Vinay. There was no one in that new org left. They all couldn't make it, but they were all unwilling to do what everybody else was unwilling to do. They were unwilling to do what everybody else was unwilling to do. They wouldn't stay late. They went out for lunch. I remember seeing a bunch of those guys in the new org going out to lunch. They did it almost every day. Okay. They got there at the same time, all the other, they just followed the, the other guys. I didn't. I didn't follow the herd. I didn't follow the norm. I did the extra because I was hungry, <laughs> literally hungry. And I then became, in a very short period of time, one of the number three advisors in that office. Now, you're probably saying, well, how come you weren't number one? Well, in that firm, there was a guy named Mark. Mark owned a company, okay, a, a DBA called ROI. And in, in, in that company, I was part of his group. So it was almost impossible for me to be number one because number one was Mark and I was under number one. You see what I'm trying to say? So number two was Mark's partner and his name was Dave. I, I, these guys were great guys, okay? But they they also didn't do a whole lot extra. They just had a really good network of clients. Parlay that back to these service techs, 46 in the service department. Just imagine if one of those folks put in the extra work, did the five extra hours, an hour extra for five days and came in early on Saturdays and pounded out a bunch of extra cars and in production made an extra $1,000 a week, but then started talking to all the other techs. Hey, look at my paycheck. You know, this is this is how much I made. And then you show them that. Do you think any other of the techs would kind of follow suit? You see, sometimes it just takes that one person to break out, that one person to do the extra, that one person to go above and beyond and the rest will follow suit. But since no one, wanted to do the extra. No one wanted to put in the extra work and do what everybody else was unwilling to do. Everybody just follows the first guy out the door and none of them are getting a piece of that extra hundred, five hundred or thousand dollars a week. And then they bitch and moan how things are going up in cost, how eggs are more expensive. Milk is more expensive. Everything's costing more. Car prices are going up. Oh my God, we can't even afford. And, and I, I asked my friend who runs this department, I said, listen, when you show them this, because he said he, he broke it all down. He, he said, we, we lay it all out on a whiteboard. We show them. And I said, what do they say? Like, they got to be able to see this. He said, their heads are nodding. And he says, yeah, but that's because he shows them what they make, you know, and what, what more they can make. And you know what the guys say? Uh, mark my words. This is what they say. And I want you to think long and hard about this. I literally, literally, this pisses me off to even say this. They say to him, well, that's not what we bring home. Brian, that's not what we bring home. As if Brian, okay, the, the, the head of the service, as if he has something to do with the taxes, right? As if Brian can call the IRS and be like, hey, you got to tax my guys less because they're not taking home as much as I'm telling them that they should be making. We all have to pay our fair share. And then they have health insurance, right? And that comes out of their paycheck. Oh, and then dental, uh, that comes out too. But Brian even goes one step further, th further and says, here's how much our company pays towards your health insurance. This is how much we pay for each one of you towards your health insurance. Right over their head, like in one ear and out the other. 
They don't care about that. It's just, that's not what we, that's not what we bring home. Yeah, we can make an extra thousand dollars, but that's not what we bring home after taxes and all the extra things you guys, you guys take out of our paycheck. Man, I, I, I'm not going to swear, but that pisses me off. It's not the company taking the money out of their paycheck. It's the freaking government. It's New York State. It's it's you want health insurance. So if you get sick, you can get actually get care. And you want to point fingers. They want to point fingers and blame the company. Well, that's not what we take home. You guys take the rest. You guys take the money out. Listen, they're doing you a service by holding back the money for taxes. They're doing you a service by holding back the money for your health insurance. Otherwise, every month you'd get a bill. Or at the end of the year, when you did your taxes, you'd have to pay a huge check and you wouldn't be able to. And then the government would charge you absorbent amounts of interest and penalties because you didn't pay on time. But yet that's the company's fault. This is the problem with this fucking country right now. It's not the country that's the problem. Sure, there's a lot of problems there. It's the people's lazy ass attitudes. You want to be fucking rich? Do what everybody else is unwilling to do. You want to be better than what everybody else you work with does? You want to have nicer things? You want to live in a bigger house? You want more money in the bank? You want more money in your investments? Just do a little bit more. That's literally where we've come to in this country. All it takes is a little bit more. And you know what? Here's, here's what's going to happen. You don't do a little bit more. Folks in this country don't do a little bit more. These service people keep walking out the door and don't want to do a little bit more. Here's what's going to happen. Mark my words. The immigrants that are coming over legally and illegally across the border are going to take your fucking job. That's exactly what's going to happen. I'm sorry, I'm swearing, but I'm like, when I hear shit like this, it pisses me off. Because the biggest opportunity of everybody's life is here right now. And all it takes in these guys' case is an extra five hours a week. And no one wants to put that time in. What else are you doing? Right, you're going home. Like, what are you doing? Are you, are you just sitting down watching TV, cracking a beer? You know, I'm, I'm not saying everybody's the same. And, and, and yes, I'm a little bit heated, but I want you to really think about what I just said, because that to me is the problem. We have a lazy population and we're breeding more lazy populations. They call them the snowplow generation. Do you realize that? It's not the, the parachute generation anymore. It's the snowplow, meaning the parents are literally just paving the way. There's no more suffering. There's no more hard times. Most people in this country, they're not living hard times. And I see it. Listen, listen, like I'm trying my darndest to make sure my daughter has to struggle in some ways, that she understands that failing is part of life and that's how you get ahead, that she understands that hard work is what is needed. What's needed in your life, folks? What's needed in your life? You need an extra 100, 500,000 bucks. You need an extra 5,000. You need an extra 20,000. Just go out and do what everybody else is unwilling to do. It's not that hard. This is a mathematical formula that you don't need to understand math about. One plus one equals two. Do an extra hour and you will make it. And, and here's another thing, and I'm going to wrap this episode up with this. Stop blaming. Stop thinking that the CEOs are the problem. You know, I, I I see this all the time. Like everybody in, in the news, you're always hearing, oh, it's the CEOs, you know, the, the and I don't, I don't know the numbers, but let's just say the CEO of Chevy and or General Motors makes 23 million a year. Let's just hypothetically say that's the number. Like, and, and everybody wants to say, well, look at how much they're paying the CEO. They should give us that money. Why? You guys don't want to work. The CEO probably works weekends. The CEO probably stays after. The CEO has a mountain of, of responsibility on his shoulders and stress on his shoulders. He is responsible for hundreds of thousands of jobs. So you want you want to poo-poo on the CEOs? You want to poo-poo on the people running the com companies? I want to ask you this one question. Have you ever, ever in your life seen a poor person hire somebody? Have you ever seen a poor person provide an opportunity for a family so that they can live a better life? Have you ever seen that? I'm, 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 listen, I'm not, I'm not coming down on poor people. I'm simply making a point. The CEOs, the business owners, the people who did what everybody else is unwilling to do. Those are the ones providing opportunities to everyone in this country. Those are the ones providing the jobs. Those are the ones providing the health insurance. Those are the ones providing the path for you to be successful. But yet you think they're, they're, oh, they're the greedy ones. And I'm not saying there isn't some greed up there in the, in the CEO space, but I'm simply saying they're the ones hiring people, not the people who are sitting there with their hand out. I hope this sinks in. I hope you realize what I'm telling you. 
And I hope just one of you that listened to this episode and thousands of people listen to every episode I put out on this podcast. I hope just one of you says, you know what? I'm going to go in early. I'm going to stay late. I'm going to be that guy or gal that puts in that extra hour. And I'm going to be the light in the darkness that shows the path to the rest of these idiots that clearly can't see this. I'm going to be the one. That's all I need. One of you. Who's it going to be? Who's going to be the one? Who's going to be the one that is the light in the darkness for everyone else? Who's going to be the one that wants more for the family? Who's going to be the one that wants to go out there and be the leader? Who's the one that wants to be the next manager of their division, the owner of their company? Because that's how it starts. You know how you move up in a company? You do more than everybody else. You prove yourself. And that ain't easy. And the sad part is it's your option. It's not mandatory. You don't have to work extra. You don't have to stay an extra hour every day. You don't have to do anything, but do not bitch and moan and complain that you can't afford things, that life isn't fair, that there isn't enough money, that you you can't pay your bills. That's on you. That's your problem. Nobody else is. Stop blaming people and start taking responsibility for your future. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I just need one of you. Who's it going to be? Let me know in the comments. We'll see you on the next episode.